Good afternoon. Our interview today, March 21st, 2021, is with Connie Morella. Connie has lived an exemplary life and has had a magnificent career playing many roles, mother, educator, community leader, state representative, congresswoman, and ambassador. When I asked her what I should call her, given all these roles she played, she said, just call me Connie. So I will just call her Connie. As I explained to you, Connie, the objective of the Marconi Oral History Project is to record for posterity the contributions of individuals of Italian inheritance from the Washington area to American democracy. So my first question to you is, is to give you an opportunity to tell us a little bit about your Italian inheritance. Who came here first, where they came from, and why did they come to America? <laughs> Thank you very much, Ciro. I want you to know that I'm very honored to be interviewed by you, and I think the Marconi Project is a, an exemplary one. Your introduction um, made me remember something Mae West had said, too much of a good thing can be downright enjoyable. <laughs> so it was excessive uh, and superlative, but it was enjoyable. Thank you. Well, both of my parents came from Italy, they both came from Reggio Calabria. My mother came from a place called Gortiria in Reggio Calabria. Uh, she and her family, I say her family, her father and her um, two brothers um, and her sister came uh, in 1909. Um, her father, my grandfather, was a widow at that time. So I never made, met that grandmother. Uh, he was a widower because she had decided she had uh, died when they were in Italy. Uh, my father, my grandfather, had come over at another time to visit a relative in Massachusetts, and then he went back to Italy and then decided to take his family. Why did they come? Well, I don't actually have a, a specific response from him, except it was an area where they had had three tornadoes. Like, I think it was like 1905, 1907, and 1909. They were almost like, uh, they were sequential. And it was, it was an area where they did a lot of agriculture. And so I think the impetus to come to the United States as a land of opportunity uh, was very engaging. And I think that's what did it. Uh, Connie, I gather your grandparents went to Somerville, Massachusetts. Is that where they? That is, why, yes, why indeed. Massachusetts, most of the people stopped in the coastal areas, New York or somewhere else. What was in Massachusetts? Connections. Connections. I think Connections probably dealt a lot with where some of the immigrants went when they came to the United States because there was a family member um, a nephew uh, who lived there in Somerville, and he had some family there. And I think that's what drew them to the area. Incidentally, my father's family also came from Reggio Calabria, from the same area. In fact, I think their families probably sort of knew each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, was, uh, he was a little older than my mother. She came when she was nine years old. Uh, and um, lived in Somerville, Massachusetts. Yes. Tell in me, fact, I was born in one of the houses where they lived wow. in Somerville, Massachusetts. So, so uh, was this an Italian community or was a small group of Italians there? Well, uh, it, I guess you would call it sort of an Italian community. Many of the neighbors were of Italian background, but, they, but it was mixed also, but mostly Italian. Um, and it had this school, it had uh, the, uh, the library, uh, where I spent a lot of my time since we didn't always have the books in the house. It was, it was a nice community where everybody knew everybody else. So it wasn't all Italian, but it, did, it was uh, predominantly, which also meant there was a church in the area. Sure. And it was a welcoming community for 
immigrants. Uh, uh, what, what did you feel that what the family was integrated into the society, or that they had a little ghetto called a little Italy in, in Somerville? <laughs> The family, because of the children, mm -hmm. um, became integrated with the community. I mean, they joined the clubs. The parents pretty much um, developed their own little community area, their own friends where they met and uh, had wine and had meals and, and uh, some faith services. But the children are the ones that reached out in terms of their um, um, desire as sports, clubs, organizations, particularly sports clubs. Uh, but you know, they learned some of the Italian uh, traits too. For instance, I saw something in the museum about a group playing briscola. briscola. Well, <laughs> that was one of the things that was played. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, um, and very, very sports minded. I think that helped bring people together. But um, there was, there didn't seem to be the discrimination that I hear about in other areas you know, in Massachusetts and in other places in the country. Tell us, Connie, you had a very good career education-wise and uh, uh, professionally, uh, went into politics. Uh, did you, being a young woman in the area you grew up, did you have any cha challenges within the family to go to school, to get out of the community, to be on your own? How did that? How did, how did you feel growing up in a in an immigrant family? So, you 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 have Italy inside the house and the United States outside the house. How did you handle that? Uh, I guess I didn't think about the differences. In a not thinking about it, I just went from one thing to another. I did have a family member who was very helpful in terms of getting me to take tap dance lessons or getting me to. Uh, to go to some cultural places. I really think that, um, that that had an effect on me. So what I would say to others is, when you can mentor somebody else, it pays off in the long run. But I did find that as a female in the household, where I had three older brothers, uh, that they were rather protective. One in particular was very protective of me. No, she shouldn't go to the roller rink. That is, you know, that's going to be a tough place for a woman to go to. I said, forget it. It's great, you know. Or when you, when I went to dances, my mother used to pick me up. Uh, my friends didn't know that, but she would meet me afterwards to take me home to make sure I had somebody with me that would be protective. So I think there was sort of that protective quality that females, particularly if they came from an ethnic background, that uh, that they sensed. No. Yeah. Of course, uh, that also ties into exclusions that women have felt throughout the years yeah, yeah, that well, I fought that's, hard that's against. True. That's true. Let's talk a little bit about your family. Um, uh, I gather from my reading in your, on your uh, regarding your background that you and your husband managed to raise a very extended family. Uh, tell us about that. Uh, I will. Incidentally, as we think about my background, I do want to mention my father made wine. Oh, Therefore, okay. when we talk about a community connection, <laughs> his bottles of wine were not sold in stores. They were given as gifts to the neighbors. <laughs> and also this whole concept, which I think is pretty Italian, of gardening raising particularly the vegetables, uh, the, the tomatoes and the parsley and basil, and we had a grapevine. All of this, I think, is part of the culture that emanates from, from the Italian pastimes and professions, which we appreciated and valued. Uh, so we had the, the ability to have a, a family of faith, a family of, um, uh, Loyalty to loyalty to family, a belief in family, and a belief in in connections. And so you're asking me about. But before you answer the question about you raise an extended family, yeah. now that you raise the subject about the wine and yeah. the garden and the, the the Italian aspects of family life, uh, I was going to ask you this question later, but I'll ask it now. Were you successful? in passing on a lot of these to your children? Because those of us who are first generation Americans have a, a difficulty at times passing on to our kids a lot of these characteristics and so on. 
I'm just curious, were you successful in passing it on to your kids? Well, we'll find out eventually <laughs> as we look back. But no, I, I tried to. Uh, I think society has changed so swiftly that there are some of the ingredients exactly. uh, that, that have passed us by. For instance, they don't make wine, That's but right. I think they enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, in terms of, of connections, in terms of cooking, my mother was extraordinary cook. I was pretty good when I had the Lodge family. I don't cook anymore. And I remember that my eldest son, who is a darn good cook, my daughter is a good cook, my other son cooks also. They've taken over the culinary um, assets or satisfactions. But I, my eldest son um, was introducing me at a roast recently, and he said, my mother loves to travel. And she said to my father, take me someplace I've never been before. He took her by the hand and brought her into the kitchen. <laughs> so I must say, that is something that I have not passed on to my kids, except to make them want to do it because I didn't do it. <laughs> so I do hope that I do, we've tried, of course, to show them the values of honesty and hard work, hard work. Mm -hmm. And if you don't succeed, try again. That's right. Um, no guts, no glory kind of thing. Whether we've succeeded, I don't know. I, I'm proud of them. Very good. So tell us about the raising family. this extended family. Yeah, I had, uh, uh, in my family, there were uh, six of us. I had four brothers and one sister. She was my only sister. My young, She was younger than me by about five years. And I was the first person in my family to go to college. And so I think in so doing, it made it easier for my sister to be able to go to college. I went to Boston University. She went to Boston College, where she met her, um, her, her the man who became her husband. She, uh, uh, she had a, a cancer, and um, she had six children, including a set of twins. And she had divorced her husband. And um, the question was, what do we do with, the, with all these kids who are pretty much stepping stones in terms of age. But they're also stepping stones in terms of age with my three children. And so the question was, well now, what should we do? The eldest was 16, and the youngest one was about eight. Um, and so I said, well, you know, maybe they could come live with us. My husband said, yes, let them come and live with us. I, I, I was just very moved by that. He never questioned, will we have room for them? Um, how are our kids going to feel? How will he feel, you know, having some of the attention taken away and shared? And yet, I, I never forgot, uh, my husband passed away about four months ago, and I always remember, the kids all came down for the service, but I always thought about the fact that anything we could have done for him, um, would not have even been enough because of that willingness to take a family into his life at that time. So he was about 50, 45. Mm -hmm. Oh, very good. So it, it worked. I, I must say, one of the things I did that I thought was superlative is that I took each one of those kids to the Motor Vehicles Administration to get a license. And I mean to tell you, if that wasn't a crucible to take them there to where they were going to get a license, <laughs> it required enormous patience. And one of them, who later graduated from Tufts, it took her four times to pass the test. <laughs> At that time, they required um, the uh, uh, parallel parking. I think they've taken that off the requirements now. But the parallel parking was such you just couldn't do it. Yeah, yeah. So we went from a Ford car that we had to borrowing a friend's little, little car, I think the smallest car they had for her to pass the test. Let's get to the Washington area. What took you to the Washington area? And when did you first learn about the Holy Rosary Church? We came to the Washington area right after our honeymoon. Why? Because my husband was going to Georgetown Law School. He had uh, been accepted there. So we came down here. I got a job 
I had worked for TWA, the airline, which is non-existent. I got a job before we got married with Pan American here in Washington, wow. which is now non-existent. So um, I had a job. He uh, uh, was a student at law school, and that's how we became members of the area. Yes, we lived, our first domicile was um, a rented apartment in Washington and uh, near Carter Barron. And so we did come to Holy Rosary Church. Shortly after we were here, we asked about churches and then they mentioned Holy Rosary. So we attended, not as parishioners, but periodically, because it was still a little bit out of the way. And that's when we heard about the beautiful church. As a matter of fact, later on, I even took Italian classes at Casa Italiana. Mm -hmm. I think I liked them because afterwards we would have a glass of wine and some snacks. Ah, that's a pretty good reason. <laughs> but, but tell us, you came to Washington, you had a family, but you find time to go to school, you got a graduate degree here. How did you do all of this? What is the secret? <laughs> no secret, just, just plain dedicated hard work. Just trying to stretch everything into the time. And, and responsibilities, like trying to get the kids to also help to be responsible for each other. And we allocated even the, uh, the workloads, like um, two of them would do the laundry for a week and uh, help to clean the table and to set the table. We always made sure that we had the PTA meetings, the kids' education. Education and working with each other were of primary importance to us as was faith, and we needed a lot of faith for it too. We renovated our house. So we took away a guest, well, a guest room became a bed, bedroom for two. A study became a bedroom. A laundry room became another bathroom. So we, we changed, we stayed in the same house, but we changed it uh, so that it would accommodate the extra children. How did I do it? Well, when I went, when I got my grad, I was teaching and um, teaching in the public schools and uh, didn't have the big family while I was doing that. And uh, then when I got my graduate degree, I did it at night. I took night school and I uh, worked at the community college. I also worked at the university and um, so it goes on. You spent a lot of time in social activity during this time, which was a precursor to get into elected office. Tell us, what, what, sure. what got you into doing all of this, other than you want to be sure your kids were getting the right education, they're going to the right places. Well, I tell you, you know, I even when I talk to young people too, I, I try to tell them, it's very important that you get connected. It's very important that you reach out to other people too. Um, and when I, I can remember even in um, elementary school and then on into high school and even into college, I ran for office. I never thought about it until much later in my life. I thought, yeah, you know, maybe there was some symptoms there that you wanted to be a leader or you wanted to help others that way. Um, but I didn't think about myself as, as one who was going to actually run for office until I was teaching at the community college and was appointed to be on a commission for women. This was a long time ago, it was 1972. And at that time, um, there was the Equal Rights Amendment that was coming, going through legislatures. A woman named Margaret Griffiths uh, from Michigan had introduced the resolution, had been introduced many times before, but she actually got it to be voted on through what was called a discharge petition. Get a, get a majority of the members of the House to vote for it. It'll, go, it'll transcend the committee. She did that successfully. So we had to get the state legislatures to pass it. So being on a commission for women, I recognized that my credit card had to be signed by my husband. I, I couldn't do it alone, right. I realized the, the, um, the fact that I couldn't get any kind of a job I wanted. I couldn't be a construction worker or a scientist or whatever, because you had the want ads, one side for women, one side for men. A woman could be a clerk, she could uh, be a secretary, um, a maid, something like that, but a man could be anything else. So that got me involved with you know, if you don't have a seat at the table, you might be on the menu. <laughs> so I thought, it's time for me to get involved. And I was encouraged by friends. And my husband, he had been sort of involved in politics um, and uh, in sort of an advisory capacity. And he didn't discourage it. He said, well, sure, look, try it. And so that was why I decided to run 
for the House of Representatives, no, but the State House. The State, yeah. Yeah, which was the uh, the Le House of Delegates, they the called Delegates. it at that time. Yeah. So when you ran for for Congress, let's skip over your, your state because we want to go on. Mm -hmm. did, well, did you find uh, being a woman, being from out of the area, did you have... Uh, who was backing you? Was it was it really this was retail politician, a la retail politicians did in those days, or who was who were your backers? Actually, I had some people who were who were involved with politics, and my husband sort of helped with that too. He worked for John Lindsay, you know, for a while, and he was on the Commission on Civil Rights, and so I met a number of people who said, you know, you would be a good candidate. And having been in the state legislature, I thought, yeah, the, the, the federal Congress is not very far from me. <laughs> and I, and uh, uh, I wouldn't have to move my house or anything. Besides, I can do some of the things I, I worked on in the state federally. And so I think I decided to run, but my friends and those who were the advisors said, yeah, you should. And so I wasn't supposed to win. I ran against a man who is a friend of mine now. He was in the state Senate, a multimillionaire, and um, yet I surprised him by being in a minority party and winning the election. All right, when I got there, all together with there were two senators and 24 members of the House that were women. And um, how did I feel being a woman? Nothing to do with my party, nothing to do with where I lived, but the fact that you were a woman was you weren't taken seriously as the men were. Example, you're in a, um, you're, you're testifying before uh, another committee and um, the chairman of the committee will recognize you and say, uh, yes, uh, yes, Connie, let's see what you have to say. So uh, you give them your response to the issue. Thank you. And then somebody else wants to speak, but it's a guy. And oh yeah, Congressman Smith. Remember, notice, Congressman Smith. What do you have to say? He'd say the same thing I said. And the chair would say, well, thank you, Congressman Smith. Let's try to do that. Let's put that into the record. <laughs> Mr. Familiar. Chairman, sounds like what I said. Thank you. <laughs> so, but I, I mean that in a lot of different ways. It's just that women, they just weren't, if a guy said it or did it, it just had more impact. And that is changing. Yeah, I can just imagine in those days, Congress was run by Southern conservatives. They were the chairman of all the major committees. Mm -hmm. And you were in Congress in those days with some people who were still around. You were there when Nancy Pelosi came, or you might have gone there at the same time. I don't remember correctly. But you had some others. You had Geraldine Ferraro, and you had a very, or she, maybe she came after her, but anyway. But, there was a very colorful woman with you in Congress, was Bella Abzat from New York. How did you guys manage to, I understand you made some progress. How did you manage to overcome all these Southern conservatives who try to put all the, not only the women, but everybody else from the North down? Well, one of the things that, back to the women's bit, we had a congressional caucus on women's issues. That was very helpful. It was an opportunity where women could come together in a little room, they called the room of room of one's own, uh, which which was a room which used to be a speaker's office. It had a statue there of John Quincy Adams. John Quincy Adams, going into history, was not only a U.S. president, the sixth president. He then became a member of Congress, House of Representatives, and he was on the the room which was uh, Statuary Hall. Now he was in that room, and where Congress met and he had a heart attack, and they took him into this room, which was the speaker's office, and he died in that room. That room was the congresswoman's room. And that room, we we dedicated that to Lindy Boggs uh, shortly after she died, and it was a statue of John Quincy Adams in the room, and she looked at it and she said, well, John, your father didn't listen to what your mother said, you know, Abigail Adams, but I'm sure she finds some comfort knowing you are here in this room, surrounded by strong women. So my point is, what do you do? People have different opinions, but if you can get together and know them, you can listen. If you listen, you learn, 
and you lead. And I think that happens with regard to party, with regard to sex, whatever it is. And Bella Abzu came after me. But what's interesting, because of the work she did, they gave her an award. And the award, the Women's Caucus gave her an award. And they asked my husband if he would introduce her, get, introduce the award to be given to her in honor of her husband. Her husband evidently was similar to my husband in that he he uh, went along with letting her, you know, have the centerpiece and whatever. So I got along with the views of uh, Bella Abzug. Nancy uh, Pelosi was elected with me. In fact, she's a few months later because she was appointed and then elected. We got along fine on HIV issues and some women's issues. I found that with all of them, how did I get along? Men who disagreed with me, who were Republicans, men who disagreed with me, who were Democrats, women who disagreed with me, who were Republicans and Democrats. How do you get along? You, you learn to respect them, not learn, you respect them and you listen to them. And, um, and as they say, you learn from them and you get along. So one of the areas that really you worked on mostly in Congress. I looked mm -hmm. at my constituency. So therefore it was very important I be on science and technology. For a while I chaired the technology committee. Remember, I had federal labs at National Institutes of Health, National Institute of Standards and Technology, the Food and Drug Administration, Walter Reed, which then used to be the National Medical College, all in my district. And I had a lot of entrepreneurs who were, uh, who were in that same district. So being in science and technology, and I had a number of excellent pieces of legislation that helped them with building, with expanding, in terms of the what they did. I had the first hearing on cloning, on genetics, um, so many of the areas that NIH has worked on. I also remember federal employees. And so therefore, the uh, Civil Service Committee uh, was one that I was very much involved with. And for a while, uh, for one Congress, I chaired the DC Committee. And so for me, that was, that was important. This was my constituency. And of course, I continued to believe that uh, human rights and that women's issues are issues for the, our economy and our society and our humanity and international issues. Tell me, Connie, uh, you run as a, as a Republican yeah. and uh, you called yourself a Rockefeller Republican. By the way, I'm from New York, so I have voted for <laughs> Rockefeller <laughs> yes. in the past, for Nelson Rockefeller. Yes. Uh, you uh, um, had to make some tough calls when you were in Congress. Mm -hmm. You had to make some votes, very difficult votes, and you often did not vote with the party. You mm -hmm. took a very independent stance. You, you thought outside the box, you're independent. Tell us, what was it like to be in that position and how much flack did you get to take some very tough decisions, including one on uh, an impeachment. Yes. Uh, well, it wasn't easy. As a matter of fact, I, I went down sort of in history as the, um, the Republican who had the most Democratic district in the country. And it, and it really was. Now, there, there are pluses and there are minuses of that. The minuses are, oh, yes, I'd have threats. Um, we once even had Please come to check on a, a threat that I'd had. Yes, there were times when uh, my children, um, those who then were married and not living there, would get notes, tell your mother to vote this way or not to vote this way <laughs> all the time, right? So you had that because I lived in the area that I represented and everybody knew where I live. Um, they knew even my phone number. We put them on, you know, speaker, but um, on my phone number. And, uh, and so therefore I, I could hear when I went to a grocery store, I could hear whether people liked what I was doing or didn't like what I was doing. But I found that the plus of it was I listened to both sides. I had to listen to both sides and I wanted to listen to both sides. And therefore I had, I had a bumper sticker that, uh, that many people use called um, Democrats for Morella. And um, so I would go to a town meeting and I would have Democrats and Republicans speaking. And so I had to learn both sides of every issue. And I was independent. I felt country, 
Constituents and conscience. Those are my three C's when I voted. And I knew that there were going to be ramifications either way. I mean, I'd find Republicans who would say to each other, well, I don't like really voting for her, but she is a Republican and she did go to my kid's bar mitzvah. <laughs> or the Democrats who say, oh, gee, it's tough I, that I'm going to vote for a Republican when I'm a Democrat, but she does do the things that I believe in. So that was a great position to be in. I was well known and people knew I was an independent they, they won't try and to, honest. You know, the uh, leadership didn't try to force you one way or the other on some of these tough decisions like the impeachment. Uh, oh, they are behind their breath or in another room. They might say, oh, that Morella, <laughs> we're not going to be able to count on her vote. Uh, I'm sure they did. Yeah. And some of them would even say it to me. I guess we can't count on you for this vote. But I must say, um, in all deference to the uh, Republican leadership, they knew my district. They knew my district. As a matter of fact, I had it won for a re-election. I had President George, it was George W. Bush at that time. Although George H. W. Bush, we got along fine, even though I didn't always vote with him. George W. Bush, I didn't. He wanted to come in and do a fundraiser for me. Not that he wanted to. My press people said, hey, the president will come in and do a fundraiser for you. You should do it. I said, I don't think so. <laughs> Not in my district. Then I thought about it and I thought, yeah, we need the money. And if he's willing to come, I'm going to take my chances. He was fantastic. He said, well, you know, this gal really works hard in Congress. <laughs> and um, she knows uh, her district too. She will vote with me when she thinks I'm right. And she won't when she thinks I'm wrong and she's doing more of the latter. <laughs> and then at another point, he said, and she, uh, she taught English. And there are those who said to me, I should take some lessons from her. <laughs> so the point is he joked about the whole thing. He talked about community and he talked about trust and leadership. I, I always, always ad admired and thanked him for that. And um, so, yeah, there were even some other Republicans who sent checks, who were, with whom I never voted, you know. And so you find people, the bottom line is people are people if they get to know you and understand you and respect you. Connie, I, as, you, as you were saying that, I was thinking, what happened to all those people that used to be in Congress in the, either party who used to vote one way or the other? rather than just vote party line every time on most critical issues. What's happening? Well, you know, I'm, I'm a political junkie. Once you've been there, it's in your blood, and you feel you should be a, a, a loyalist to the Congress concept and, and try to help where you can and try to be honest about where you think help is needed. And I think that's the major problem in our country, the polarization, the polarization it is not only with regard to the political parties and what's happening in Congress, it's coming, it's emanating into the public. Right. You'll find even people saying, well, I don't want to do this because that person is so-and-so. Or even in households where there are debates, debates that become more than just I discussions, know. you know, about it. But I'm finding in, in classrooms too, in groups, more and more this polarization of course, I think it's up to our leaders to change it. I hope it will happen. But right now I feel sort of estranged from what is happening in the Republican Party. And I don't think the Democratic Party is handling things as well as they could either in terms of the groups. Sure. Yeah. So I hope it will change. I will do all I can to you promote it with young people. You're a political people. junkie. So you must be thinking about this question that many people think about. What does it take to get back to a more normal functioning society? Not just I, Congress, but society. How do we do that? I think the press need to help us out. I really think the press need to think about what they can do to foster working together, concepts of working together. You know, I get the Washington Post and I get the, um, um, the, the, the journal and one, versus the other. They're quite different in terms of how they look at issues. And I, so I think the press have something to do. 
I think civics should be taught again in schools. I agree. You know, I, I taught my very first time teaching, I taught, I taught civics. And um, I just think it's important that these kids know what's going on. Right now, even now, if you want to know something about who represents you in a certain state uh, district, ask somebody who's trying to get citizenship because they're the ones that have to study exactly. the history <laughs> and the right. civics, right. right. So our kids need to know it. They need to get more involved. Uh, and and I, I think of course of Congress starts it off that way. They do their town meetings and they talk about working together, that would help. So I think all the way along the line, I think the press, I think, and I think it, and I say the press, I think also advertising, you know, that's done political advertising. I can't blame the press for that. I can blame the candidates and the, the PR people that work for the candidates who say, you're going to have to jump on somebody yeah, yeah, yeah. with this nasty, um, um, a nasty thing on television or whatever. We'll, you know, get the money to pay for it and then we can do that. So I think that, I think our young people, I think we need to have more clubs where people talk about what's going on in uh, their legislative bodies and get more people to join groups to yep. do that. Connie, you obviously had to raise money for your campaigns. Yep. What do you, what do you think is big money or dark money doing to our politics today? What, what do you think of that? It's, it's terrible what, what is happening. I, I'm also now part of a group called Issue One, one being O-N-E for the First Amendment. And um, it's bipartisan, former members of Congress, former, and why former? Because they don't have to raise money, of course, but, and they can know, they know exactly what the uh, effects are of that money raising on taking up their time. <clears throat> Coming up with a lot of ideas about what can be done about rules for lobbying, um, what, uh, what can be done about uh, areas like uh, Montgomery County, Maryland, or states in coming up with election laws with either matching money or limitations on what you can raise. All those kinds of things that can be done and some of them are being done. Raising money now is far more than it, than it was. In fact, in our state legislature in Maryland, you cannot raise money during the term. Now again, the term is, money, is like uh, January through April. And you couldn't quite do that that easily with Congress. But if Congress came up with a system where they were three, three weeks in Congress on Capitol Hill, not going back on Thursday night to mm -hmm. their home and coming back late Monday, uh, where they live there, and you could give them more money for housing, and then had one week where they could go and do their town meetings, and they could raise money, they could do events. I think if we did something like that, we'd have more of an opportunity to put more of a clamper on what money is being spent for uh, campaigning and issues. I used to do like uh, uh, golf tournaments. Sure. I had a number of golf clubs that were around and Columbia Country Club was a good one and let the lobbyists pay big money to play golf. <laughs> uh, but I would do little coffees um, and tell them I hope for the magnifying effect that for every one of them, they would bring in five people to help out and, and, uh, uh, and contribute personally. Uh, now, not as much as being done personally. You're not getting as much like knocking on doors. Right now you've got the airwaves that they use and Your that Facebook. costs money. Yeah, exactly. So I think there are a lot of things that we need to get get to the heart of and inch by inch try to change so that we have a democracy where people can differ with each other, where they can run in a race if they have the ability and the desire and the passion and not worry that much about money being the only object of whether they get attention, let alone get elected. Yep. <clears throat> well, let's move on. I want to talk to you about about your ambassadorship to the OECD. But before I do that, I would like for you to tell us a little bit about your husband. Yeah. Your husband was clearly very much part of your life, obviously, <laughs> married yeah. for 62 years, I think. 66. 66. That's right. I was five. <gasps> but it doesn't matter. It was a long time. <laughs> uh, uh. And uh, well, tell us about 
his role in your career and then tell us a little bit about his career and finally his um, relationship to the Watergate. Oh, yes. Uh, and, uh, hearings and cases and so on. I, yes, uh, my husband was a lawyer. Um, he and I had some different personalities. I mean, I was much more affluent, effluent, you know, and uh, he, was, he was a little more stationary. I mean, for instance, if we went to a party, I would have worked the room and he would be sitting there. He would spend his time talking to one or two people, whereas I had talked to a hundred. Yeah, well, Nevertheless, they paid more attention. That's why you were in politics and he wasn't. <laughs> yeah, that, that's right. But that was that was more his personality too. Yeah, he sure. get into get into sure. people, you know. And I'm buzzing around. He was a very successful lawyer. He was also successful at American University Law School, where he served many roles. He was their general counsel, um, and then of course he was a professor and he was a dean uh, at the law school. So he cared very much about education and legal education, the ramifications of it. He at one point also worked for John Lindsay. This is this kind of got him into the political arena. Um, he had met John Lindsay um, at an organization that he belonged to. And John was then going to run for House of Representatives. And he asked him if he would work with him, and he did, and he won. This is before John Lindsay became the mayor of New York mm -hmm. and ruined his own career. Yeah, he, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, but while he was in Congress, he was great, you know. He was more the Mac Mathias, Nelson Rockefeller type, right. Uh, he met John Lindsay, uh, and they worked together on an issue. And... Um, John Lindsay was going to run for Congress and got Tony involved, and Tony became his legislative assistant. And at that time, Tony, actually Tony worked for George Meader from Michigan before he worked for John Lindsay. So what I'm saying is that my husband knew something about Capitol Hill. He then uh, met Nelson Rockefeller. And when we talk about Nelson Rockefeller and what happened with the Republican Party and all. It was in 1968 that he went to that convention. I remember that. Yeah, and he was a Rockefeller supporter at that time. Uh, so he met John Lindsay. John Lindsay was a really a folksy guy, a nice Italian guy, you know, and um, no pretensions. And um, John Lindsay asked him about some lawyers. He said, you know, I'm, I'm gonna need a lawyer when this on this tapes case, which is whether they'd open the tapes up to the public mm -hmm. that Nixon did not want to open up. And he said, can you suggest some? And Tony mentioned some names. And John Lindsay said, "Very. what about you, Tony? <laughs> oh, well, no, no, I don't really feel I'm qualified. You know, he's very modest about it. Well, John talked to him and said, you are qualified. You can do it. And he did. And that's how it happened. And I remember discussions in our in our home. John would come to our house and sit in our living room and they would talk. And Tony didn't have to really go to him. So it was a it was really a a nice um situation where you got to know somebody and you appreciated them. When he became man of the year, there was a big celebration for him, and of course we were there. And I met Joe Lewis. Remember Joe Lewis? Yeah, yeah, the, the congressman. Um, no, not John. Oh, John, no, Joe, Joe, Joe Lewis, the boxer. The boxer. boxer. Sorry. He had been, he had been the best man at John Lindsay's uh, wedding. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. And so we chatted for a while and whatever. And I said, gee, you know, I'd, I'd love, I'd love to have a picture of you. And he said, no, I'll send you one. I said, but, but really, what I want, I want one of the boxing pictures. <laughs> So I have it. He autographed it, a boxing picture. Yeah, exactly. John Lindsay was a great man. So Tony, back to back to Tony. Tony, Tony came into our marriage with all of these credentials. I probably would have been a re, a Democrat, you know, except when it came when it came to voting. At one point, on the ballot was a man named Mac Mathias, whom Tony had worked for as a volunteer giving him information on running in the state legislature and then running for Congress, which he did successfully. And he was sort of, I guess, I guess you'd have to call him a liberal Republican, open-minded Republican. 
and I liked John Lindsay and he had a primary and yeah, I was a Democrat. So to vote in a primary, I couldn't vote for him because he was a Republican. <laughs> so I changed parties to vote for him. And then I was going to change back. And then I thought, but you know, I agree with his stances and I agree with Rockefeller and I agree with Jacob Javits and I agree with a lot of these other people. Why would I bother to change? So that was why I stayed a Republican. By the way, all those people you mentioned just now, I voted for them as a young man in New York. You see? Right, yeah. exactly. And because, I voted Democratic. But, because these are, these. Yeah. this is the moderate wing. These yeah, exactly. are the people. But those yeah. people have disappeared. I know it. In, in which I, you're I, unfortunate. I grieve. I grieve over it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I do. Well, let's talk about uh, Paris and the OECD. Uh, tell mm -hmm. us a little bit briefly, well, what I is know, the OECD, know, which is the off the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Bravo. <laughs> not everybody can say that. <laughs> well, I, I've been in those meetings. I've been to the place. I know it. <laughs> well, there was a man named George Marshall, and uh, he spoke, I think, to the uh, uh, to Harvard. Uh, this was after, right after the war. He had been everything. He'd been uh, Secretary of State and whatever, and then General and, and all. And he spoke as Secretary of State at Harvard. And he talked about a family of nations, that after this war, we should come together because we are a family of nations. Okay, that idea became the Organization for Economic Cooperation. Cooperation. And it was about 16 nations Sorry. that came together. This was, a hard, this was a very difficult thing to do. Imagine, we have been, the United States has been involved in a war and we're gonna help con other countries when we need to help ourselves. We're gonna give them some money and expertise. Well, that became the Marshall Plan. And, um, and the Marshall Plan from that developed what is now the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD. So it emanated from that. So you can say we grew and were born because of the Marshall Plan. Now you hear everybody talking about, yeah, maybe we need a Marshall Plan in Venezuela, or maybe we need a Marshall <laughs> Plan, you know, for these immigrants. And what they're talking about is, you find out what needs to be helped, you pull those resources together, and you let the people that you're trying to help tell you what they need, what they need, and it may vary. I mean, you know, one country, Italy might need something, and Germany, not Germany, uh, uh, France might need something else, whether it's education, infrastructure, whatever, and you give them expertise and you give them money. So that was the Marshall Plan, and this is now the most developed nations uh, that belong to this uh, OECD. Um, it was 34 when I was there, and it's gone up a few since then. They have to meet very rigid requirements. What does the OECD do? It tries to level the playing field. It tries to let the best practices of the U.S. be taught and given to other countries that might need it. Like we had the, um, the plan um, for, um, well, we work on money laundering, that's one of the things. But there was a plan also the, uh, for antitrust. It was the Corrupt Practices Act that we had in the United States, which became uh, an issue that OECD picked up and now 44 nations agree with it. What does it say? It says that you cannot pay off for, uh, another country to help you in your campaigns. Uh, France was actually allowing a tax break for that to happen. That's right. So because of That's the, right. it's called the anti-bribery convention, anti-bribery convention, and that has been successful. They did a lot with nuclear energy, They've done a lot, as I mentioned, money laundering, taxation. And what's interesting is they work by consensus with the except, few exceptions. They have to get all these countries to work together. Now that's not easy to do, but what does it take? It takes working inch by inch with these countries to get them to see how one practice is going to help them. And therefore, sometimes it takes a while for something to, to pass as a convention but when it does, it has full support. I think it's a great organization. When you were there, what were the major issues being under consideration? When you, the, you were there from 
203 the good to old 207. Theater. That's right, exactly. Yeah. You have it exactly. I went the, the full gamut. Well, money laundering was... Was, was, was Gurria already the yeah, director? It, no, he was elected while I was there. Yeah. So I was there at the beginning. I've known him for many years. Yeah, he's leaving now, you know. Do you know they He's have, leaving, yes. Yeah, a man from Australia. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love Angel. He's great. Yeah. yeah. In fact, I, I, I then went on the American Battle Monuments Commission, which I tell you about. So I was over in Europe often, and he would always say, you got to come by and see me, and we would chat. And yeah, yeah, I liked I liked him very much. He, I think he did a good job. Um, and so yeah, so what what were the issues? Um, obviously, money was a big, the primary issue. Energy and nuclear power continued to be on the uh, uh, the wavelength. And what I would find that I would have to do is every Monday I would do a video conference with the State Department people who were involved in the issues that I was going to be discussing within the next couple of weeks. And I would find out what they think about it. So I'd have a certain group. And then I would tell them what I'm hearing from my colleagues. i say, well, you know, Turkey's part of this and there's no way, if you're going to talk about Malta, that they'll even get involved at all. I mean, they'll, they'll fire things up. Or I would say, you know, Switzerland um, um, uh, doesn't like this idea and you're not going to it's not going to fly. Let's try such and such. So we would debate. I would debate with my own people uh, sure. in the United States about what my uh, stance would be. Once it's decided, then I go all the way. Unlike being a member of Congress, I can't make up my own mind. <laughs> That's I mean, right. you're an ambassador. That's you're right. following you, what your country wants. You get talking yeah. points from Washington. <laughs> That's right, and I give them talking points too. <laughs> so you work it out in that regard, but then you go in there and you're, you're representing the United States. Uh, what we did do is, again, something that ties into what I've been trying to say about getting to know people, is that it was almost a requirement that once a week, one of those countries would have a dinner party, a dinner party inviting the ambassadors and their spouses. And uh, sometimes they would do it two nights because they would have to divide them in half, you know, so you did that and your weekends were free. So you could get together on weekends and get to see France or other places. And but the the socializing was during the week and sometimes even at lunches. Um, you would do you get to know you get to know their different subcommittees. You would get to know your other ambassadors. So when you left, you knew the ambassadors, you knew their wives and you knew their families and they knew you. Well, talking about the OECD, you know that uh, there's a, a, a very strong point of view now in the United States that we should go with the American first philosophy, that we should pull out of all these institutions, that uh, we should focus on the U.S. and our own problems. And as, a, as someone who's worked both in Congress and has worked at the OECD and international organizations, how do you see the role of the U.S. in the next, I don't know, it, in the immediate future? Are we going to be pulling it back or uh, are we going to stay and be the beacon of democracy, the shining light on the hill? How, what's, what's your perception looking back? You've got a lot of experience or do you think this is a, t it's a temporary phenomenon will we'll go away? I hope we will be that beacon on the hill, a beacon of democracy. But, but, you're, but you're right. If you start pulling the United States out of these international organizations, it's a lose-lose situation. For instance, our involvement in OECD allows things to happen in these other countries legislatively and in terms of, of uh, practice that benefit us. They know what we believe. You know, John Donne wrote the poem, No Man is an Island. That's right. I would say no country is isolated as an island. We, we have our connections um, for good or bad. And so I think uh, we should be hesitant to even think about getting out of some of these international organizations. We should weigh them. And as a, as a matter of fact, we were thought of very highly at OECD. 
people always look to the United States. I think they do in all these organizations too, to which we belong. We are the number one donors, and they know that we are uh, the, the symbol of democracy. So they look to us, and I think we must make sure that we convey that, um, that, that trust uh, in terms of our practice. So I hope it doesn't happen. We see, we've seen semblances of that with the lost administration, and I can see us getting back into the Paris Accord, World Health Organization, staying with OECD and the others, and, and benefiting from them. I think so. Oh, I think, they, I think we have to let them know how we feel about things. Of course. But you can do it, you can do it easily with the facts and be persistent. I say have patience, persistence, and, and um, yeah, and passion. Passion, passion patience, yeah, and right. persistence. Sure, yeah. you have the three Ps, absolutely, absolutely. Well, one final question for those who are gonna listen to this, to this history, oral history project, and supposing this is a young woman listening to you, what advice would you give this person who wants to go into politics. What would you tell them what they should do? What advice would I, I you would, give? I would try to encourage them. Say it's really critically important you get involved in politics. Politics is many things. You know, it, 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 it goes in many different directions. You can get involved in politics by writing communications, get involved in politics through uh, campaigning, you get in politics in terms of issues uh, by running yourself. So there are many different areas. You are the seat of government, the young people. They are our leaders. So and so it's important leaders. they know, important that they know what is going. I would say no guts, no glory, try it. And uh, uh, patience uh, will make a difference with a plan, with a plan. I say go for it. Well, thank Connie, you. thank you very much for this very interesting interview. Uh, you have given us a lot of good ideas. The purpose of the Marconi Projects is to leave for future generations to learn from the history that people like you have created in this country. And so we are very grateful and uh, uh, I hope uh, you uh, will have a uh, very uh, continued career. Ciro DeFalco, you've done a great job of moderating and I hope I haven't been all over the course fragmented, but I've enjoyed it thoroughly. And I particularly appreciate what the project is going to do for other people.